there's an isolator on the state. Um, the uh, size distribution of, of the, uh, within, within longer, um, sorry, so the, the, the structure of the dust grain, so whether the dust grain is compact or whether it's fractal, um, and finally, of course, the impact velocity. So, what kind of velocities do the two dust grains have when they collide with each other? Uh, and then finally, sort of for the overall dust growth, you also care about the collision frequency. Uh, and the, the uh, factors that determine that are the cross section, so essentially the size, the density, the number density of the particles, and again the relative distance. And so all of these parameters um, are hard to determine theoretically, so they're figured out by lab experiments. And I have some movies later on where I'm showing. They literally do this experiment, colliding particles with each other, in order to see what happens and in order to calibrate the efficiency of, the, of this, this coagulation process. Um, so when two particles uh, collide, there is there is actually different possible effects. Of course, in the ideal case, we apply everything to just stick together. Uh, it's also possible that to uh, particles of light, that they bounce off each other. Uh, there could be mass transfers, so you know, uh, things collide on each other, part of the mass ends up on, on the other part. Uh, fragmentation, so you could have two particles that collide on each other and then everything just goes over fragments. So in that case, you actually decrease your, your particle sizes. And finally, erosions, where small particles erode the surface of a larger particle and slowly make it smaller. Um, again, the outcome of two collisions depends <coughs> usually on the, the relative uh, on the, on the velocities, but also the relative grain size. So if you have one grain size on this axis and one grain size on the other axis, you can be in you know, the bouncing regime, the sticking regime, so the sort of in the low. If you have these small grains, you uh, are very likely to stick together. But if you have a small grain and a large grain, or uh, that depending on how large and other parts you can bounce, or can be, you, can be, you can also get mass transfer. There's this whole regime where you just get fragmentation if the particles are, are the same size uh, and large enough. So essentially, there are many different outcomes when, when two particles collide with each other. So here are a couple of these uh, movies that I was talking about. Let me see if it actually they start playing. Yes, they do. Okay, so here's a movie. Where so they, they literally get in a lab uh, vacuum chamber and they let dust grains move around and in some cases the grains actually stick together and they put some kind of spotlight on it to be measure what the dust grains are uh, doing. Then in the next movie, let's see if I can make it. Here we go. So in the this movie you see bouncing. So this is uh, uh, some of larger particles that are more likely to bounce off each other when they collide. Uh, and finally, fragmentation. So here we go. We have two dust grains. Let me go. Let me play that one again. Here we go. Dust grain, other dust grain, and everything gets gets fragmented. Um, so by determining um, what mass, what velocity. And what composition uh, results in these different kinds of effects, of effects we can essentially create uh, or, or estimate uh, the efficiency of each of these processes and, and the parameter dependence. Um, there is also some computational work on this, so this is mostly uh, uh, based on this, this idea that a dust ray actually consists of many like, little particles stuck together. Uh, so, so fractal structures, and also here I have some, some movies that show what can happen. So in this case, two fractals collide with each other and then compactify. There's another. Oh. But here in one, we have two fractals that move at relatively high velocity, and they will fragment. And this is another coagulation. I, I actually like I think that's more like a hug, but yeah, <laughs> still. <laughs> So, uh, so these are computer simulations. The previous were, were uh, lab simulated lab experiments. Uh, a lot of these, a lot of the efficiencies of these 
processes are still being determined. And we only have some rough estimates of how, how efficient they are. Um, so when we, uh, we think of dust growth, uh, usually at the smaller sizes, so this is again, this is bottom, bottom uh, up growth, uh, we think of it as, as orderly growth, so we have small particles that start to grow to larger sizes, and over time we find larger and larger and larger uh, dust grains. This is, of course, only working as long as you don't have fragmentation. So this is only at the early stages of dust growth. Um, then, as soon as you have some larger dusty embryos, Say you have one really large fractal, and there's still some smaller dust, dust fractals around. It, they may start to collapse, uh, for example, due to gravitational forces, and in that way you can grow in a process of what's called polymer. It, they may start to collapse, uh, for example, due to gravitational forces, and in that way you can grow in a process of what's called polydispersed growth. Um, and the uh, Experiments show that the, the fractal dust, in these, the, uh, what we have also seen in these simulations, are actually very easily produced if you have collisions at low velocity of these small compact dust grains. Um, and then you will, you will get this really like, extended fractal dust grain structures that are then easier to collide when they collide with each other uh, to, be, to form these even larger. And the property of, of these fractal dust grains is, is actually that their diameter over the mass is, uh, is fairly high. Uh, however, if you have high velocity uh, collisions between the small grains, it's more likely that the dust grains com compactify uh, or hug. Uh, or if you go even higher velocity, they will fracture each other. Then, um, uh, so the other possible outcomes is if you have these compact or maybe porous, so this is, it's sort of like compact, but then there's still a little bit of a factor structure, so these are, these are more likely to be formed by high-velocity collisions. Um, clearly their diameter of mass uh, is uh, a little bit lower than the for the fractal ones. Um, okay. So I've only mentioned that there is this uh, that there is this probability that if two particles collide with each other, they may not stick, but they may instead fragment. And if you if you have a box with dust particles that are moving around, so like there's different different sizes, different velocities, um, you will you will always end up with a balance between coagulation and fragmentation. So um, you can integrate this over time, and in the end you're left with a, a dust size distribution that is the result of coagulation and uh, But because of that balance, there is always a maximum particle size um, that will uh, dominate at that particular location. And this, uh, this maximum size, it, it depends on the conditions, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, identified here, so it depends on the gas, local gas surface density on uh, a alpha parameter. So we do need the alpha here. Alpha is very low, maximum uh, maximum base size is going to be very large as well. Mm -hmm. the larger size. Then there are some constants, you know, high, four, three, uh, rho s. It's like an intrinsic dust density, which is one. Uh, the sound speed, and finally this vf. This is the fragmentation velocity. Um, so this is the, the velocity um, that is usually taken as 10 meters per second. So this is based on, on lab experiments. So above this velocity, things will always fragment. Um, but the fragmentation velocity can be lower in uh, the presence of ices. So it's, if, you, if you think of a disk, Fragmentation velocity is usually set uh, at 10 meter per second outside the, sea of the water snow line and to 1 meter per second inside the water snow line. So, why is it lower for ice in those places? Why, why do you more easily get fragmentation when, uh, 
sorry, when they're not IC, I phrase that question wrong. So why is it lower inside the mother shell? The ice is more sticky. The ice is more sticky. So That's outside the snow line. So, but, so what does that mean for inside the snow line? Inside the, 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 the snow line, uh, there is not enough uh, ice, so, mm -hmm. so the particles is not uh, get sticky more easily. So, exactly. so, so yeah. the velocity. Yeah. So the yeah. idea is the idea is that the grain is less sticky and therefore more easily yeah. fragments. Yeah. And I will update that slightly because I phrased it exactly the wrong way. Um, and so this uh, so this A max is uh, shown in this plot here, dominant particle radius, uh, as a function of this location for different values of that fragmentation velocity. Um, as you can see, then that um, the A max depends on this location mostly because of our gas surface density that is also dependent on the radius um, and some level on the, on the sound speed. Uh, and then depending on your assumed fragmentation velocity, you get slightly different values. Okay, so we've talked uh, quite a bit about coagulation, fragmentation, uh, essentially collisions between particles. But now, how do you get dust particles to move in this? Because if everything just moves on perfect circular orbits, they're never going to collide, right? They all stay in the universe. But it turns out that those particles actually move around a lot randomly. So there is Brownian motion. Uh, there is turbulence. Okay. Maybe, maybe there's turbulence. Um, there is settling. So this is essentially the fact that the, because of the gravity of the disk, the middle plane uh, being more massive, those particles sink towards uh, the mid plane, uh, which means, so that means you always have some vertical motion downwards, and that means that they have a chance to collide with other particles that are moving in the uh, that are in the um, And finally, your radio has multiple drift, which I'm going to explain a lot more detail uh, in the five minutes. Uh, each of these processes, each of these movements of dust particles, depends on the grain size, which you express by the Stokes number and can lead to dust, dust collisions, which can then lead to correlation and, and fragmentation. Okay, so this uh, settling um, that I was describing, so this, the, the settling is, is uh, like I mentioned, is the idea that larger dust grains will sink more quickly to the middle plane due to the gravity of this. We can calculate the settling velocity, and we can verify the settling time scale by again, a number of Parameters. Um, and as, so, at the one hand, you have the gravity of the disk, but on the other hand, you have the uh, stirring, uh, the vertical stirring of the disk, uh, which again depends on alpha, so there's this vertical turbulence that we talked about before. Um, and the, uh, the SC parameter, which um, which is an expression of the Stokes number, which, as I mentioned, is an expression of the grain size. We're going to get to the formula of the definitions. Uh, the effect is that the stirring time scale is essentially um, uh, the stirring time scale is longer for larger particles. So therefore, the balance between stirring and settling. Um, becomes um, more favorable towards settling for the largest dust grains. And so the effect of that is that the, the large dust grain population with this, uh, even though it may initially be flared, it eventually becomes, becomes flat. And it also means that your dust to gas ratio in mid plane becomes uh, <coughs> higher of, as a function of time. So also here we see what happens um, essentially after one year, so it's just the gas ratio as a function of the vertical height of the disk. Um, so let's see, so we can read this. So after
So initially, you're going to have this dust to gas ratio, or gas to gas ratio of 100, the dust to gas point of one. That's this curve, so time zero. Um, but over time, when we go to longer and longer time scales, this region, and then further away, that dust to gas ratio drops, drops off. Right? So your dust to gas ratio will go lower, your gas to dust ratio will go larger. Um, and if you go to further and further time scales, you, you will see that the dust to gas ratio becomes larger for a thicker, uh, thicker part uh, of the disk because more and more grains settle towards the uh, uh, and also the, the grains, because they are set, settling, because they're moving down towards the middle, they will grow to larger sizes, which is called sedimentation. Um, the uh, settling itself has a strong dependence on the alpha parameter, which we talked about uh, earlier. Um, so let's see. Here we notice the uh, so now we're, we have the vertical height of the disk as a function of radius. We see that the larger the grain, the more settled things are. Uh, but this is for alpha 10 to minus 2. And now if we go to alpha 10 to minus 4, you see that that same grain size, 100 micron, this curve, is uh, basically half, half of the initial curve. So, uh, the lower alpha, the more settling you get. Uh, and so you may remember that earlier today we, we actually used settling as a way to say, well, the alpha turbulence has to be really low. That is that's based on this mechanism. And, uh, and there's another uh, there's another very beautiful example of settling uh, that came out like, earlier this year. Uh, in the O16, 31, 31 disk. So there's an edge on this, this that we're looking at from the side. Um, they measure the dust containing emission here in white contours, and in the, in the colors and the blue contours, we are uh, measuring the CO emission. So the CO emission is showing the flared disk structure, the, extent, the extended vertical height of the gases, but the container is extremely flat. And in fact, the, the settling is so high that you get a really, really high dust to gas ratio, and that enhances uh, pebble accretion as a, as a way of increasing uh, planet formation. Um, and, and in comparison, this is another paper that came out actually at around the same time. So, this is a class zero disk, so a very embedded disk, a very young disk, also agile. And this disk, uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not as flat as this one. In fact, when they try to subtract a flat disk model from it, they're left with these sort of butterfly like wings that are probably consistent with flare. So, in the class zero disk, the millimeter dust disk is still flared, like all the material is still stirred up. But when you get to later stages, all that, all those stirred up millimeter dust particles have settled down. So, this is really an evolutionary. Okay, so this was all about the vertical transport. Now we're going to uh, probably more important parts, more observable parts, uh, that's called the radial drift. So radial drift is uh, the movement of part of dust particles equals towards the star, and I'm going to explain to you how it works out. If you have a typical disk, protoplanetary disk, Gas and it's smooth, there's no structures whatsoever. Um, the gas surface density and the temperature drop radially upwards. Right? So that means if you have a negative pre pressure gradient throughout this. Because of this pressure gradient, gas particles, uh, and also small, tiny dust particles that are coupled to the gas, um, they don't just feel the gravity of the star and the central focal force, they also experience this additional force from the pressure gradient. Uh, because of that, they don't move capillary but subcapillary. And this is a, a very small effect. It's only 0.5% slower, typically, at, at, uh, 
in, in the outer part of the vessel. But the gas is not going to move a little bit slower than compared to However, if you have already grown some larger dust plates uh, as well at this point, those dust plates, which are shown over here, for example, they are not coupled to the gas. Um, and therefore, they don't feel this pressure gradient, they don't experience this. They want to move on simple comparing points, but they're surrounded by all this slow moving material, relatively slow moving material, um, that they experience as a headwind. Therefore, they lose, when they orbit with this, they lose angular momentum and drift inwards towards the star. This is called the radio effect. It's the effect that larger dust bands experience a headwind from the slower moving material as a result of the, the, the pressure. Um, now, and I, I've been talking about, you know, large grains and, yeah. Uh, yes. Is what explains the vibration? Uh, like vibration events? Yeah. No, no, that's it. That's it. Oh, that's yeah. no, so this is uh, it's a mechanism that really has to do with how dust dust veins uh, move through uh, move through the vapor. And uh, yeah, I was, I was just about, yeah, so I was going to explain that next. I I'm, I'm talking about like bother large. You have large veins and you have small veins. That's a little vague, so we, 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 want, we want to quantify that. And this is done by way of the, the Stokes number. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the value of the a few times. So the Stokes number is a property of a dust particle. But it's not really that I can hold a dust particle, measure its size, and say, OK, so this is the Stokes number. No, the Stokes number actually depends on both the rate size, but also the local gas surface density. So it depends on where it's located in the disk, what the local gas surface density is, what the Stokes number is going to be. And then the drift velocity, so the efficiency that it's um, experiencing a headwind and drift inwards, um, depends directly on that Stokes number. Uh, so you can see that here the dust velocity, uh, sorry, the, the drift velocity. Uh, initially increases with Stokes number up till Stokes number equals half. Um, so these are the essentially the, the largest grains in the uh, in the lowest gas surface density you could say. Um, but you can imagine that millimeter grains um, have a different Stokes number depending on whether they're in at 100 AU or at 1 AU. Okay, so if we now we put all of this together, so we have coagulation, fragmentation, and radial drift. Let's now try to put all these equations in one big simulation and see what the resulting dust uh, distribution is. Uh, so there's a model uh, of Alemania uh, taking some gas disk evolution, I think it's actually business disk evolution, uh, coupled with all of these dust evolution effects, uh, and then Calculating as a function of time, what is my paint size, uh, depending uh, as a function of distance from the start, so as a function of radius, and what is my density in each location. I'm just going to run, I'm going to run with it. So you see that the time goes up, and every uh, every sort of every time step, we see that the density of the largest grains starts to increase here um, in the in the top part. But then eventually it starts to decrease again because these large grains that are um, that are drifting inwards. Okay. So here we go. So initially we're just growing grains to larger and larger sizes. Uh, but then over time eventually those large grains will start to drift inwards and then you lose them. So the effect is that we get uh, a small number of uh, large rays that are mostly located close, uh, close to the home structure. So this is the effect of radial drift. Dust particles go inwards and then uh, many of them get lost onto the star and also only a small fraction of the dust rays, a small fraction of the dust rays 
remains. If you want to play with this yourself, there is this desktop package available on GitHub where you can essentially set your gas disk distribution. You can, uh, you can then essentially calculate what happens to my, my grain size distribution. Um, then there is this, uh, this interesting effect, so we talked about this earlier, that you can change your fragmentation velocity inside the other snow line. Um, and uh, so they, they did that in, in this particular model, right? That is the model. So now you actually see that the grain size is, uh, you would kind of see that in the, in the simulation as well. You see that inside the other snow line, the maximum grain size is actually a little lower than just outside the other snow line. This is because of the assumption that ice grains are stickier, therefore less affected by fragmentation uh, than the grains inside the other snow line. So just, this is just part of the, uh, of the same effect. Okay. Um, so this, this uh, radio drift problem, uh, or radio drift uh, mechanism, is obviously a very big problem if you want to form plants. Because the, uh, the grains at like 100 AU in this cannot grow beyond millimeter sizes. So if, because as soon as they grow towards that size, they, they get to a Stokes number where they drift in water very quickly. And um, therefore, this is the result of the radial drift barrier. You cannot grow beyond a millimeter at a uh, Sometimes it's also called the meter size barrier. So, my question for you is when is radial drift affecting meter size dust grains? What do you think? Why would we call it a meter size barrier? You have to think here of the definition of that Stokes number. So millimeter size particles at 100 AU drift inwards really quickly. This depends on their Stokes number, so on the combination of their size and the local gas surface density. So if you remember the quantum mechanics, this the gas surface density is higher, closer in, and further out. Right? So that means that the dust particle, a millimeter dust particle at 100 AU, has a Stokes number of, let's say, uh, 0.1. Um, a millimeter size particle at 1 AU is going to have a much lower Stokes number because the gas surface density is higher. Right? So that over there, that millimeter particle is not going to drift inwards that quickly. However, a meter size particle will again have this higher Stokes number. So the uh, meter size barrier is, is essentially the radial drift for meter, meter size particles at 1 AU, but it's equivalent to millimeter particles at 100 AU. Okay. Um, so, so this, this radial drift problem was already calculated in, in the 70s. It was immediately said, like, yeah, this is a problem because if you, uh, if you lose your millimeter dust particles so quickly, if they all drift inwards, how is it possible that we're still measuring mini strong millimeter emission in discs that are, you know, several million years old? Because in several million years, all of those millimeter particles must have drifted inwards already. Um, so this, this comes down to this to, to uh, the question, how do you stop the radial drift from happening? Well, in order to answer that, we have to go back to this graphic, this cartoon. And something, so we, we talked about the pressure gradient and how particles move. Um, but something that you may not have realized before is that so the consequence of radial drift is that large dust particles always move in the direction of high pressure. This sounds a bit counterintuitive, but it's because of that interaction between dust particles. The large particles move towards high pressure. So what you want is a high pressure point 
a high pressure region in the outer part of the disk where particles uh, basically stop. So large particles will move towards the outer uh, high pressure region. So, uh, uh, other way to create a high pressure region in the outer part of the disk. Uh, that is, if you form a planet, a planet carves a gap, and then at the outer edge of that gap, uh, you naturally get this over density of the gap, so that, that becomes a pressure maximum, or uh, we also call that a dust trap. So any pebbles from the outer disk will drift inwards, right? but then they get stopped at this location because on the inside of that, the inner part of that Dust trap, you have a positive pressure rating, so that pushes the dust particles uh, outwards. Um, and essentially, the, uh, the, uh, the forming plant will, will carve this, this kind of gap. That's actually shown in this, uh, this simulation here. Uh, you can see a planet that is orbiting a star, and sorry, it's a bit slow. Over time, other than the strong density wave, what you see is that along the orbit of the planet, the color becomes a little bit darker, meaning that you get a deeper and deeper gap. So, as soon as the simulation is finished, you're ending up with a deep gap along the planet's orbit. Uh, then you can absolutely average the gas surface density. It will look like this. So, now you have the gas surface density as a function of radius. Here you have the planet rotation, and here you have the gap profile. And then you can calculate what is my pressure radius as a function of radius. Um, and now we simply have our pressure maximum, right? this again for a number of alpha values, by the way. Um, so we can cal calculate exactly where the dust is going to be trapped at the outer edge of our, our planet's uh, orbit. Okay, so how does this look like in terms of dust evolution? So, so we have the same plots as before, we have the main size vertical axis, distance from the North Star, the radius of the horizontal axis, and density of the dust in, in colors. But instead of <coughs> a, a smooth gas yes, surface density profile, we now have this gas. But what, now what happens with the dust evolution? So <coughs> dust is still drifting, like some dust is still drifting inwards. Um, but then the dust, uh, but sorry, I say this, I'm saying this wrong. Let's start over. Sorry. So the dust that is located here in the inner part of the disk will quickly grow to larger and larger sizes. Um, so it actually goes all the way there up here, two centimeters, seven centimeters. And, well, and again, you see, this, you see the same effect as before that after, while it is growing, it will actually also uh, drift inwards and again. Some of the particles, like maybe the particles remain. So, this inner part is the same as what we saw in the original. Um, in the outer part of the disk, and I'm going to play this again, we are also growing our dust particles. And dust particles are drifting inwards. So definitely the largest grains are here on the inner part. But they don't actually drift further inwards. They grow in that pressure maximum and they stay there. This is uh, how a dust trap can be so powerful. As soon as you have some pressure bump in the outer disk, your dust particles will move towards it and then only grow in that location because they're no longer, they no longer feel this drift barrier, but they no longer move inwards quicker than that they can grow. So, why is this scenario of the dust trap not the ultimate solution for planet formation? Mm -hmm. Is there anything illogical about what I just said? So, yeah, there is, but I want to like you to tell me what it is. Because it doesn't explain the nearest planet for a star. The what, sorry? The nearest planet for a star. Well, it actually doesn't explain how that first planet was for us. I don't think that maybe that's not what you meant. This scenario requires a planet to create a gap and a dust trap where particles can grow to form plants. So 
This is essentially a chicken egg problem. You need a planet to form more planets. So maybe they, if for some kind of magic happens the first planet is formed, uh, we can form multiple planets. It's somewhat uh, like what you said. Um, but, the, uh, but it's still a question of where that first planet might come from. And um, yeah, the, there, there are several ideas of, of how uh, why this is the case. And it's, it's actually funny, if you go back to the, the older papers of the past revolution, um, initially the idea wasn't so much, oh, let's, you know, let's put a planet in there to create this pressure bump. The original idea was, well, there are all kinds of, you know, instabilities, hydrodynamic instabilities, uh, perturbations that create small pressure variations throughout the system. For example, zonal yeah. And those kind of pressure pumps will maybe be able to trap part, a little bit of the dust and in that way maintain some of the dust. But this was, this was the uh, pretty paper by Father Nia, uh, where this, she, she, she says, well, we have these perturbations, these zonal flows with like small variations in gas density. If the perturbations are small, like amplitude of 0.1, you would, like, you would get a little bit of ring like structure, but then Pretty quickly, you most of your dust will, will be affected by radio So there's sort of a minimum uh, amplitude, like perturbation strength, before you can extract your dust and then maintain your dust over time. I can see that in this plot. So this is the amount of dust uh, in this as a function of time for different amplitudes of that perturbation. And you can see that if, you see, if there's no perturbation, if the A is zero or if A is point one, your dust mass decreases very quickly at two orders of magnitude within five million years. But as soon as you are above a certain thresh threshold, which is point three, you can actually maintain and keep all your millimeter particles trapped in the outer part of this. So this is more or less the idea of, of dust trapping as a solution for planet formation. Um, if you have some kind of hydro instabilities in the early stages of the disk that can trap these millimeter dust particles, maybe in that way you can start the planet formation process. So then as soon as you form one planet, you can continue from there. But you need some initial perturbation. And we don't really know yet what that is. Okay. So, so far I've been talking just about radial pressure pumps, right? But there, there's also, um, let's see if this is actually a movie. Yeah, go. Um, but there are also some cases where this radial pressure pump can become Rossby wave unstable. And I mentioned this also in the, in the lecture from yesterday. This Rossby wave instability is, is like, you know, when you pour milk in your coffee, when you look at clouds uh, that are, uh, during, during certain times of weather, they get this spirally motion this is due to friction between different layers of fluids. You can get the same thing in a, in a rotating disk. Um, and this Rossby wave instability uh, of a radial pressure bump uh, can result in these large scale, long lived vortices. And here, here you see a vortex. It's this as removal over density in the gas. Here you see a vortex as well. Eventually, these vortices are going to combine and form one very big vortex. Um, so these, these as a moonfall over densities uh, are essentially pressure bumps that act both in the radial and also in the as direction. So they trap the dust in both uh, dimensions. And uh, simulations have shown that if you, uh, yeah, that the trapping is actually really efficient in the as direction. So the way that the particles move. They get trapped very quickly. And here you see this, uh, this surface density as a function of azimuth. Uh, if the gas has like, this small over density of like a factor of two, uh, micron rates are you know, kind of are built with kind of similar in contrast. But as soon as you go to a larger areas, you get this very, very intense concentration of rates. And that's where you can get dust asymmetries. Okay, so with uh, Alma, we think we have seen many of these dust traps. Essentially, all of these structures, these large scale dust structures, like gaps, rings, asymmetries, 
um, are thought to be dust traps. We don't know for sure what is causing the dust trap. And I'm going to talk more about that this afternoon. What is, what is the origin of the pressure loss? Um, and yeah, what additional information do we have to say that this is a planet gap or maybe something else that is uh, But it seems pretty evident that the uh, that the dust structures itself are uh, dust structures. So what is the observational evidence for all of these dust processes, all this dust evolution in the disk? Um, well, first of all, we have this, this, this uh, figure that I showed you in the beginning, where you see that the 12 CO and also the small dust veins are much more extended than the dust disk. So this is evidence, direct evidence, that dust indeed the sort of mini dust indeed drifts inwards. It's much more concentrated than the gas. And there's still some, some gaps in radius, right? It's not, it hasn't drifted all the way in, it hasn't you know, actually fallen to the star. This is the same disk? This uh, is the same disk, yeah, yeah. I showed it in, I think, and I think. The scale? At the same scale? Uh, yeah, on the same scale. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's the same disk or the same scale. The 12 CO disk really is a lot factor two, three larger than the minimum tested. Um, we see that there are still some raising gaps here. So there are dust traps, just that the dust traps are pretty close to the star compared to the initial uh, probability frame Okay. Um, so the, the, the problem with, with testing uh, along this, these dust, uh, like essentially whether we have dust traps or radial drift, is, is a little complicated. And the reason for that is that in order to, to see a dust trap, to, to um, see a dust rain, you need high angular resolution. And if you, uh, because if you observe a disk with the gaps and rings, like for example this one, at 0.04, here you see the gap, right? But if you observe the same disk, and these are listed in the same, these are observations from the same disk, you just see a plot at 0.3 centimeters. So, so just from this disk, from this image, you cannot say whether or not a dust trap is, is there, or whether this is maybe just a disk early in the stage of radial drift. Um, we have these snapshot surveys of protoplanetary disks, but they, so we are we met like 100 disks in one star in the dust uh, but they're definitely taken at low resolution. So we see some disks that have gaps, right? Uh, but also not where, where we don't see them. We cannot rule out yet that the gaps are there. We're going to talk a little bit more about this sort of observability of substructures. Um, so instead of, you know, substructure or no substructure, we can, we can also look uh, at other observables in the disk, like the, like the disk size. And well, the clearest example of that is the gas to dust size ratio. And I've showed you that example of TWA Hydra, the gas disk being much larger than the millimeter dust disk. Uh, but we have actually have more observations um, that, that show um, that where we, can, where we can make that measurement. So these are a number of disks in, uh, I think, Lucas and Torrance. So we have the gas disk on the vertical axis and the dust disk on the horizontal axis. Um, the measurements are shown over here, and clearly, they're, they're, and these are the different ratios. If you have a ratio of uh, three times the dust disk size is the gas disk size, then, then this is like this one. As it turns out, most disks are between sort of 1.5 and 3. So the gas disk is between 1.5 and 3 times larger uh, than the dust disk. This is um, uh, and, and we actually have, have similar measurements here. So this is the CO over the dust disk size uh, measured for a number of disks. Uh, I see here. And so in, in, in this case, the data points are shown in gray. So also here, the, the, the gas to dust size ratio is about a factor of two to three. The problem is that drift models predict ratios of about 5 to 10 or even 20 or 30, so all these color points. So drift models, they 
that, that, that within a few million years, your dust disk is only 10% of the gas disk size. And this is not a period of survey. Um, so the conclusion of this work, or I suppose of these works, is that, well, drift is not complete in the disk. Drift has been halted. So there must be dust traps present in this disk, even if we don't observe them yet, simply based on the, the gas to dust uh, size ratio. This is the same effect as what we've seen for, for the year ahead. So now we have, at least for some disks, we, uh, we know that uh, the dust traps must be present. However, there is one example where the drift B may be okay. That is this disk called the CX Tau. Uh, so, which was observed at very high in the resolution, 0.04 at second. This is a picture of the dust container. The dust container disk is only, I think, 10 AU in radius. Uh, well, the gas disk uh, from the South CO, uh, so this is showing the bottom map. Here we see in black contours the dust. But you see the gas disk is much more extended. In fact, the, the, the ratio here is about a factor, is at least a factor of six. So this is actually much more consistent with the drift dominated disk. Also the fact that we don't see substructure even at this high resolution is pretty convincing. So this may be a true example of a uh, disk without dust traps, but all the dust has, has drifted inwards. And you know, if we take another look in about two million years, all the dust will be will be entirely gone. Um, then another thing, another um, observable that you can look at to, to test whether disks are uh, essentially whether, whether the drift is complete or whether they're dust maps is by way of looking at the so-called size luminosity diagram. Um, luminosity is the flux, the size is the radius of the disk. Uh, models show that if you have drift you get a steeper slope then when there's only fragmentation and there's no um, the and then, so these are these are model results and here we see the same plot but then with the data points and sorry this is just this is a very hard plot to read I, I don't think about it um, these, the triangles and the diamonds are the data points or the measured sizes and fluxes um, and the Blue curve is essentially the, the fit through all of those data points. And essentially, the scatter within the data points is so large that we cannot distinguish between the two. Um, and uh, yeah, but something to, to note. So these are these are the data points itself. This is something very confusing that in data papers they tend to flip the axis. So here you have the flux of the vertical axis and the radius of the horizontal. Here it's the other way around. This is the size of the vertical axis and the flux of the horizontal. So whenever you make this conversion, remember to flip, flip the axis to, to plot things properly. Um, the overall the conclusion is that yeah, there is so much scatter, it cannot be the case that all these disks are drift entirely drift dominant. There must some of the disks. In some of the disks, the drift must have been halted. And then, uh, yeah. and then there's a, a third modeling paper where they didn't, so they looked at you know, what, what happens to disks that are, are drift dominated, but they also looked at disks that have um, a planet embedded in it, that, that have dust. So here on the left, we see, uh, again, this is the size luminosity diagram. On the left, we see a smooth disk, so a drift disk, and most of the models end up on this line, so it's a pretty steep line. Um, but as soon as you have dust caps, you get this somewhat more flattened structure, but then the dust also becomes concentrated in dust traps. Um, the overall conclusion is that if you have dust traps, you get this somewhat shallower slope in the size of the velocity diagram. Then for a drift disk, so the, the red line is from the planets and the white line is from the, uh, from the drift. 
But the problem is that we only have data points in sort of the upper end of this plot, where these lines are almost next to each other. So again, we cannot really distinguish it. Also here, uh, for our current disk observations, we cannot confirm yet whether there are dust clouds or drift until we get like really high angular resolution for all of them. Okay, we can, uh, and, and, uh, I don't know where we are now, number three, I think in terms of observables, um, to test if uh, disks are all affected by, uh, by dust resolution is by comparing disk dust size as a function of age. So we look at the typical disk dust sizes in young regions um, comparing that to those in all these that are stuff. And so this plot is, is showing that distribution. So what are the typical disk dust sizes in you know, the fewest forests compared to disk dust sizes in, in the scope? And there is a downward trend. So the, the average, the mean disk size, uh, disk dust size appears to be increasing. So that seems to be consistent. Um, then there is this other trend, which I actually thought, uh, the, this one, so the problem here with this plot is obviously that there are very large error bars, right? There's a large scatter in these, these disk dust sizes. Um, a plot that, I, that I've always found in the normal case is this one. So this is, a, uh, in this case we measure not disk dust size, but disk dust masses. And the way to measure disk dust mass is essentially the flux. Uh, integrated flux times the distance squared uh, divided by uh, a few factors. We'll talk about, we'll, we'll derive this equation tomorrow in, in this mass uh, uh, um, it, So, this is kind of representative for the dust mass uh, based on the emission map. Um, if we now look at the cumulative dust mass distribution, so that is, is essentially the, this plot, you look at other <coughs> what is the probability that a disk is larger than a certain dust mass? You see that the dust masses in the youngest regions are significantly higher than those in the older regions. So the disk dust mass decreases with age. And that is, again, consistent with radio grids. So um, if we look at um, a drift disk or a dust trap disk, in a smooth disk, a drift disk, your initial dust mass builds up because your grains are growing. But then it's sort of one million years, you're, you're finished with growing and then the drift really starts to take off. Right? And then your dust mass actually drops really quickly. So we saw this before in the simulation. Um, however, if you have a dust trap, your millimeter grains build up, your millimeter dust mass builds up. And then it stays there because it doesn't actually drift inwards, right? So then you maintain your dust mass all the time and your dust mass is constant. So um, looking at the trends from the observations, the fact that the dust mass decreases over time suggests that the bulk of the disks really are affected by radial drift and lose their dust mass. And um, yeah. The, the, the last one. Yeah. Is this only because the radial drift uh, there is not uh, uh, creation taking account? Well, climate formation, for example. That it, yes, those things are possible too. So the dust mass drops over time, and one of the ways to explain that is by dust evolution. Yeah, but you're right. The um, the accretion, so the the gas mass is expected to decrease as well. But that's not what we're measuring. So, in principle, this decrease in dust mass, even if the gas disk doesn't evolve at all, is always expected to decrease. Yeah. But you're right. Like sometimes this plot is used as an argument for overall disk dissipation, but that's not what it's showing. But it's possible that it plays uh, plays a role as well. So. Yeah, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this whole issue of like, are most disks, do they have dust traps or are most disks drift dominated? Please don't 
clearly this is not, uh, we haven't really answered this question yet. Because we don't have enough observations, of, uh, high resolution observations, to really rule out dust traps or measure the really small dust disks in, in many cases. We'll talk more about that this afternoon in the, the lecture about self structures. Uh, but at least these measurements of dust mass and dust disk size give us some first clues on what is happening with the bulk of the disks. So how many disks actually have dust traps, how many disks uh, don't. Uh, then I do want to show like very, uh, you may have seen this name pop up many times during this lecture. Camilla et al. Just want to point out. So Carla uh, is from Colombia. She actually studied at the uh, University of Los Angeles. Uh, but she got her PhD in Germany, uh, then did a postdoc in Leiden, where she and I were, were office mates, so we, we worked a lot together. Um, she has run so many dust evolution models over the last 10 years. She has written so many incredible papers in connection to the, to the dust evolution. Um, so this one's the highlight that yeah, since I'm I mean Colombia knows she's an incredible person to look up to and yeah if you if you want to know more about um, being a Colombian abroad and working in astronomy in, in other countries um, you should definitely reach out to her. Okay. So um, to summarize dust evolution, so the dust clearly evolves separately from the gas. There's all these additional dust evolution effects um, that have nothing to do with the gas dissipation. Um, the dust evolution itself depends on the presence or absence of pressure bumps. Whatever is causing those pressure bumps, right? Um, in case there's no pressure bumps, in case of radio red, the dust mass decreases much more rapidly than the accretion rates and the gas mass rates. So this kind of answers the question, right? Um, and it's an important argument to never use a dust mass to measure the gas mass to just multiply by a vector because we don't know if the dust mass is affected by the radio print. <coughs> uh, also happens, more about uh, Dust evolution timescales depend on a number of unknown parameters like fragmentation velocity, sticking efficiency, turbulence. Um, some of those we can still work on in the lab, some of those remain basically unknown, basically unconstrained. So hopefully we can constrain them with our observables. Um, and for, yeah, in order to, to properly measure the observables of this evolution, we need, always need to combine gas evolution and this evolution together. So with that, I think I'm just going to end it. I had a few more slides on evolution, but I'll, I'll leave that for, for a later lecture. I have to sit up time. So that's it about this evolution. Thanks. I don't know if there's any other questions. So all of this is a little clear? Yeah. So there's not any problem that I've tried to like overlap the drift and the box models? Um maybe not a need to call it like well like, yeah, so so drift and, and fresh models, yeah, they so those are uh, Essentially, those are the same time, right? So, the, in, in a gas density, the dust particles will, uh, that are large enough, they will always turn to inputs, unless there's pressure in there, then they get cold. So, this is essentially a combination of the effect. The drifts and trapping are caused by the same physics. We use the videos that I showed. Yeah. Like yeah, so, so, the, so I think most, most 
is evolution models should be no pressure models. Uh, so you let the test evolve like this is this model or this is model or whatever, and you actually just change the structure of time, and then you just evolve on top of that. That means if there's no perturbations in the answer, you're just the same. However, if your natural gas is evolved, for example, with a forming plant, then while the gas is evolving, the plant will just start carbon in that and then just will get trapped in the outside and then build that. And then it's So, yes, those, those general, that is being done. Um, but uh, if you can just hide models, also to the cost of the carbon in the shell. Um, they usually start from a fixed gas resistance profile or uh, maybe only a business evolving gas resistance profile. And only that does the whole It's, I think it's still being, so as far as I know, it's still being hard to do the combination of a hydro model, so there are kind of parts of that, and does the evolution at the same time. Maybe that's, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, um, so the plan for now is, well, obviously you can take a little break now if you want. Uh, and after that we are, the plan is to continue with the tutorial from yesterday. Uh, I think many of you uh, were not that frightened, they didn't finish the tutorial, and that's totally fine because we started really late yesterday. Um, so I propose you go back to sit in the panels where you were before and make work together through that tutorial. Uh, and after, uh, after everyone is finished with that, we can start working on the, the new Alma project. Um, I don't know if anyone is, is anyone finished with the tutorial? No? Okay. Let's just assume that this is what we're going to do this morning and that this afternoon we'll, we'll go to Alma project. I'll explain that because it makes more sense if we all start together. Yeah? Okay. But again, feel free to take a break now as well. Well, uh, I don't know about the time we're gonna have lunch break. Uh, we can we can stick with the original. Like just uh, yeah, twelve forty five. Yeah, 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 that's fine. We're yeah. not uh, we're not going far away. To no, yeah, lunch. we can stay here. Yeah. So so I'll be here until twelve forty five at least. If you have a question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question was.